So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jan Soroman from Masaryk Institute in Prague, and uh, I wanted to welcome everyone in our discussion uh, of the book uh, To See a Mus, The History of Polar Sex Education by Agnieszka Kościańska. Uh, and this discussion is organized by the uh, platform History and Philosophy of Science in Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe in cooperation with the platform uh, Gender History of uh, Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Uh, I will send the links uh, in, the, in the comments in a second. Uh, and I'm very happy that we can exactly inaugurate our uh, next semester. It's, it's our second year uh, of Global Book Talks. And I'm happy that we can inaugurate uh, the second year with discussion of Agnieszka, Agnieszka's book. Uh, the book appeared 2021 in uh, English translation in Berkan in New York. Uh, and I hope that we, you had a chance to, to read it, to, and whether either in uh, English or before in Polish. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, we will have uh, Agnieszka to show short to present the book, uh, and Ella Rossman and uh, Denisa Nistiakova, uh, who will be commenting it. And the idea is that we will have a, a discussion about also not only about uh, the Polish sex education as a case study. Uh, but also how we can look with this case study, how we can compare it with uh, with other cases, exactly uh, with a Russian case or the Soviet case uh, and the Czechoslovak or Slovak case. Uh, so I wanted to very shortly introduce uh, Agnieszka Kościańska. So Agnieszka is uh, Associate Professor uh, at the Department of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at the University in Warsaw. And uh, at the moment, Leverhulme Visiting Professor at Oxford School of Global and Area Studies. Uh, and she works on gender, sexuality, uh, sexual violence, religion, and racism. Uh, and her probably two books that most of us will know uh, is exactly the uh, To See a Moose, the History of Polish Sex Education, 2017 in Polish and 2021 in English. Uh, and the book uh, Gender, Pleasure, and Violence, the Construction of Expert Knowledge about Sexuality in Poland. Uh, 2014 in Polish and uh, 2021 in Indiana University Press in, in, uh, in English. Uh, and uh, as I said already, that we have uh, two commentators. Uh, so the first commentator is Denisa Nistiakova, uh, who is uh, at this moment research associate at the Herder Institute in Marburg in Germany. Uh, and at the same time, faculty member at Comenius University in uh, Bratislava. Uh, and she works on gender history, among others, on gender history uh, of uh, Slovakia, or Czechoslovakia and Slovakia. Uh, and uh, right at this moment, uh, a book she edited will be appearing, which is called uh, In Czech, Mod Sexu, Sex a Sexuality of Modern Dina Slovenska, uh, which is about the sex and sexuality in modern history uh, of Slovakia which as I understand is forthcoming and should be printed in, in a month, more or less. Uh, so then uh, happy to, to have you here. Uh, and our second commentator is Ella Rossman, uh, who is now a PhD student at uh, SSES uh, at UCL London. Uh, and she's working on uh, girlhood in late Soviet era. Uh, and Ella uh, has worked also on uh, the question of uh, of gender, girlhood, and and sexuality uh, in Soviet Union, especially in the Soviet, uh, uh, and uh, especially in the former Soviet, uh, especially in the late Soviet Union, uh, and she worked on, also on the history of feminism in the 20th century uh, and uh, history of uh, most recent gender studies. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to have three such great speakers with us, uh, and uh, I would ask now Agnieszka to to start by presenting. Uh, a few ideas about her book. Thank you so much for <clears throat> this kind introduction and for for the invitation. Uh, and many thanks to Denise and Ella for to taking part. Uh, so let, I will just I know that we are all really tired of uh, Zoom meetings. So I will be very brief and just say a few words about uh, about the book for those of you who haven't had the chance to read it. Uh, so, uh, yes, so this is, uh, this is the cover, um, and this, this, uh, so let me just start with just some basic facts. So I wrote this book for, in Polish, 
for a non-academic publisher. So I see this book as a work in public anthropology or public history. And I uh, and I, I see that I see this book as something which I wrote in in reply to young people questions. So one of the sources I work uh, with was uh, were letters sent to uh, sent to various institutions, press or plant Polish plant parenthood. And uh, there are those young people who really want to know something about uh, sexuality. And there are adults who just happen to forget that they were young one day and they just make it very political. And they are just arguing about, <clears throat> about how sex education should be done. So, so I saw this book as some kind of engaged project in which I could, I could show this history which, uh, uh, in which I argue that, uh, in which I argue for a better sex education also, not only telling the story, but also somewhere between the lines, um, I would like to see better, better sex education in Poland. So, and I'm also, some questions I had in mind while writing this was how we as uh, anthropologists or historians could address socially important issues, how, how we can do it in our work and how we can challenge popular or stereotypical interpretations of, of various processes and how we can use anthropological thinking or theor 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 theorizing in the public debate and how how anthropology or history could contribute to I know public health or health education or sex education. So these were the broader questions I asked myself while writing and writing in this non not truly academic format. Uh, however, in order to to do it, I did uh, I've, I've been working on the history of sexuality in Poland for for almost ten years before uh, working on this book. And most of my research uh, were um, either archival or ethnographic. So when it comes to archival research, I'm an anthropologist by training, so I did some ethnography as well. But a lot of uh, a lot of materials I work with uh, were letters sent to uh, sent to sex educators. I got the whole collection of of letters uh, which were sent to uh, to the Polish Planned Parenthood. And uh, I also collected letters uh, from press and uh, look at answers to them and went through handbooks, sex education handbooks and manuals and things like this. But I also did some ethnography in those spaces where sex education is either discussed, where the sexual knowledge is being forged, but also in those places where sex education is, is being, uh, being taught. So, so I was trying to uh to you know to to look as broadly as uh, possibly <clears throat> and when it comes to uh to my argument what i'm showing in the book uh so there are i think three basic uh basic issues so first of all i'm showing that sex education is not about uh, uh young people's lives or their bodies or their pleasures or their sexual agency or freedom but but it's mostly about the nation and the family and the state. So this is this is I think very Foucauldian, uh, Foucauldian uh, approach I'm taking here, where when I see sex education as something that it's crucial for uh, uh, for thinking about the state and 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 the family. I think the family here is it, it's very important. Uh, second thing I I'm. I'm trying to show in the book is that uh, uh, if we historize sex education and see uh, see it in the broader process, uh, long term processes around sex education, we will see two visions of the nation and the state divided by certain ideological uh, uh, by uh, ideological boundaries. So when we see now conflicts around around uh, sex education or what is called gender ideology or LGBTQ ideology, all those LGBTQ uh, free zones, I think you all heard about uh, that appeared in Poland. So these are the issues. So I think in this book, I'm trying to, to show that these are not new 
conflicts, but this conflict, they go way back to even early 20th century. And finally, I'm trying to, to go against our, our typical thinking uh, about these issues, and especially against, uh, against linear, linear thinking about the, the development of the history of sexuality. So, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm arguing against our thinking that we have constant progress. So I'm showing progressiveness and conservatism as two, two forces that they just, uh, they go like this, like that, or, <laughs> and not necessarily in one direction. And I'm also trying to deconstruct uh, other uh, dichotomies, like for instance, secular uh, and rule, rule, uh, secular and, and religious. So I'm showing some, and especially in the Polish case, when we have a, such a strong Catholic church, uh, the, the really strong Catholic church, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to show that this church message is really diverse and changing over time. And also uh, the same I'm doing in the book with with uh, urban versus rural. So I'm trying to should, I'm also I also look at some kind of traditional peasant way of sex education, and how they were you know uh, sort of civilized under socialism into something uh, more uh, modern. They were modernized, but it, it didn't mean necessarily that they were uh, more progressive thanks to this. Okay, so just uh, just briefly, uh, let me just at the end uh, catch the the history. Go very quickly through the through like the more than hundred years of sex education in Poland. So uh, having in mind all those three uh, three big issues. Uh, so first of all. Sex education uh, started in Poland in the very, uh, I mean, in not in Poland as an independent state, but uh, but uh, in, uh, in partition Poland, already in the early 20th 20, 20 century, and uh, in Polish-speaking schools, and there were also first uh, first sex education handbooks that you can find them, and then in the interwar period, uh, there are also sex education classes in Polish schools. And they reappear in the 1960s uh, in Poland, and um, uh, and there's this really strange situation in the, under socialism that there is sex education in schools, but there is no there is some kind of curriculum, but there is no handbook, and uh, there's uh, it really varies from school to school. Some schools do a really good job; they invite either doctors or Planned Parenthood or activists. And some schools they just uh, uh, don't do that well. Uh, so so it's very it's very diverse. But if you look at materials uh, from that time, like those uh, that you have here on a, uh, uh, on a on a slide, uh, these materials would uh, would be very often quite conservative when it comes to gender uh, gender roles and. They were very much about the family, and they would, uh, they would uh, place sex within marriage, and they were quite acceptable by uh, by they were usually acceptable by by the Catholic Church, but at the same time they were they were quite interactive, and they were often based on young people questions, and uh, and uh, sex educators would be open to to young people needs. So. So that was uh, mm, so. This sex education would be mm, in the in the seventies, sixties, seventies, quite quite conservative, but at the same time like, open to what what young people would like to know. And this everything changed in the eighties when finally the the handbook appeared, uh, sex education handbook, and it uh, uh, it was. School, a book for schools uh, written by this guy you can see here on the picture, uh, Wiesław Sopolok. And this handbook was just totally different to what was uh, there earlier because it, um, uh, it really showed that it really affirmed uh, uh, young people's sexuality and said that sex is for pleasure and that, yeah, and it really put a big stress on young people's sexual agency. 
So it would say, well, this, this is the knowledge and you, you should just uh, do whatever you think you, you want to do. I'll, I'm just giving you this knowledge about pleasure, about uh, contraception, about sexual orientations and so on. And this is all, there was no morali moralizing element in this, uh, in this handbook. And it really answered all sorts of questions that young people would ask in, the, uh, uh, in letters and so on. So what, what you see here on the slides, there are letters collected by this sex educator from young people when he did uh, classes at schools. And, and, and the handbook also had some sexual positions like this. So, and it only lasted in Polish schools for about two months. After this, it was removed from schools and called as uh, being demoralizing and mostly under the pressure of the Catholic church, which was still under communism. And uh, so here you have some, uh, uh, some example of, of criticism of this, uh, of this book. Uh, so, so that was this really strong ideological uh, attack on, on this book that it presents what, and th these are the things we see today that, that it's the demoralization of youth, that the handbook presents contraceptive mentality, and that this is, this is organized by the, by the international conspiracy, meaning the international Planned Parenthood to kill unborn children and destroy the Polish nation. And authors would write, for instance, it is not, for instance, something like this, it is not difficult to predict the proliferation or grow of sexual nerv neurosis, teen pregnancies, uh, a new wave of sexually transmitted diseases and the killing of, the, of unborn babies still developing in the wombs of uh, young girls themselves to children in secret or worse, under pressure from their own parents. And one of the bishops would say, that this is uh, was really criticizing uh, the state for publishing this handbook on the the year of of the visit of the Holy Father John Paul II to his fatherland, uh, and another Catholic activist would call the uh, call the the handbook of call the book the handbook of uh, masturbation and defloration, and this is what you have here in the slide. Those of you can who can read Polish, I didn't invent this. this. This was actual title in a Catholic magazine in the, um, uh, in the 1980s. So, and, and, and this particular, uh, particular um, article criticized the handbook for giving too much agency uh, to young, giving too much freedom to young people, that young people should be told what they should do, not, have a choice to have sex or not to have sex, to have pleasure, not to have pleasure to be homo or, or heterosexual or so on in, in the life crisis. So uh, yeah, so so the, the issue of, of young, people, young people agency was really crucial here. Uh, and uh, just to, uh, to finish, sex education after socialism was very much organized by the very people who criticized this progressive handbook in the 1980s. And so, so you can really trace that the, 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 the same people who mobilized already in the, in the 1980s to, to do sex education in New Poland, uh, which was uh, very much about, uh, which was, which, which, had, which became way more conservative in the 1990s and even more now. And it basically uh, places uh, sexuality only in marriage and shows everything else as a part of some kind of international conspiracy against the Polish nation. And, and it's really, uh, if, if you look at, uh, at the sources for this conservative uh, approach, they are very often, uh, these are very often transnational sources, uh, you know, well, well connected to radical right in the US and, and uh, in other, other places. But at the same time, uh, this is what's going on in schools. And here you have uh, some uh, handbooks that uh, appeared in the 1990s. This one, the orange one is still, it's the only one which can be used in Polish schools. And, and this, 
and it essentially says that sexuality is only in marriage and and it uh, pathologizes homosexuality and all sorts of non-marital non-reproductive sexuality but at the same time there's quite a lot of, uh, at least at least used to be till recently quite a lot of uh, feminist or queer peer sex education in in polish schools so one thing is the official sex education in schools and the other one it's the unofficial okay so i think uh, i stop now uh, uh, and th this is i think the basic uh, basic ideas of the of the book thank you so much for allowing me to present uh, thank you, Agnieszka. And uh, now, since one of the keywords was about family, then uh, I would give the, the floor now to Denisa, who is working you know, for the last three years in a project about exactly the socialist family and family planning. Uh, so, Denisa, please. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very glad to, I can be here today, but I will start directly with a criticism. This is not necessarily criticism of the book, but criticism towards the academic life. Um, so, um, I haven't been in academia for too long, but my perception it was always that there are too many of researchers who are dealing with too many of the irrelevant topics. And there are also many scholars who still deal with a very important issues, but somehow manage to write or talk about it in the most uninteresting fashion possible. And then there are so, some scholars who just important topics and managed to explain them in a highly sophisticated but still extraordinarily attractive way. And one of those scholars in my eyes is Agnieszka Koszczenska. So when reading Agnieszka's book, I had a lot of fun. Sometimes it made me laugh. Sometimes I was massively disturbed, but most of the time I was genuinely captivated and inspired. So to everybody who hasn't read it yet, I highly recommend to read this book. It's definitely worthy. So I'm definitely far, far away from being such an expert on the same top topic in Slovakia or Czechoslovakia as Agnieszka is this whole Polish case. Nevertheless, um, your book, Agnieszka, gave me um, some particular points which are super interesting also for my own research. And um, uh, it also shows that your case uh, enables us to tell us more about other cases and the history of the sexual education everywhere. Agnieszka's book inspired me to read my sources basically against uh, your sources, and thus my findings seems to be a little bit more interesting and exciting. So today I want to bring up some points which spark most of my interest and points which I can include also within my 10 minutes. And I will add, add some bits from the Slovak case, but please do not expect from me too much of the structure, but this will be more of the bullet points and things which really struck and re, uh, kept in my mind. So in the, in the shadow of the current attacks on uh, gender studies or so-called gender ideology, women's sexual and reproductive health and rights, or fights against the LGBT plus communities, we can see a lot from our country's past. And thus sexual education is indeed not only a matter of public health and pedagogues, but also many different disciplines might be able to read a lot about uh, of our position, of our current positions. So I find Agnieszka's chapter on sexual violence, for example, especially interesting because the whole topic of the sexual uh, harassment um, came into more of the attention in Czech Republic and Slovakia, especially in 2020 and 2021. This chapter tells us a lot, for example, about the blaming of victims and where is it basically coming from. I had also a lot of fun reading the chapter on sex education in the countryside. And apart from being amused, so, so Slovak scholars, especially the ethnologists also of the 19th century, used to also make the exact point. There has been too much of the idealization of the countryside, portraying some idyllic picture of Slovak purity, somehow moral super superiority and traditionalism, which is supposed to be a role model for the society even today in Slovakia. So I was just wondering to which extent, even today, the countryside carries certain features represented in your book, Nishka, and to which extent similarity to, for example, the Slovak case are also in Poland, that the countryside is still positioned, positioned, positioned against the sinful urban environment of the big cities. 
Just to bring uh, a bit from the Czechoslovak or the Slovak case. So similarly to Polish case, it also shows how much of relatively progressive sex education guidelines maintain a very gendered attitudes towards partner sex and the positions of women and men in it. Only later, for uh, I mean, in Slovakia or state socialist Czechoslovakia, only late in 1950s and in 1960s, a broader audience received some books encouraging women to take the active role in sexual life, but also outside of marriage. Such, uh, such attitudes arrive from expert knowledge, as, for example, Katarzyna Liškova pointed out in her book, A Sexual Revolution, Socialist Diet. This means what were the most crucial findings in sexology in Czechoslovakia among psychiatrists, physicians, etc., and mostly the people working directly in a marriage counseling became uh, popularized in the version of the, some sort of guidelines for married couples or even just partnered couples. One of such books for couples was a book by Jižina Knobluchova, um, published in 1962, titled Love, Marriage and You. The author um, emphasized the need for communication between the partners, despite the fact that the idea of a double standard on sexuality of men and women and the need for female so-called chastity will prevail in a society. I will quote a little bit about, from it because it's interesting, I believe. Quote, men often takes woman's ability to reveal which ways of loving is particularly pleasant for her and to show a desire for love with an astonishment and with apprehension. He fears that a woman is too experienced and he uh, identifies the woman's ingenuity in the ways of love with bad morals. It is a relic of bourgeoisie morality, according to which a woman was not allowed to admit that she enjoyed her sex life. So I find quite interesting this book because it's definitely bringing the position of a woman in a sexuality a little bit to a little bit more active position. The author also encouraged the couples to get inspired by the Kama Sutra and creating their own couple manuals, for example. And they're also talking about the content, a consent, telling no touch, no caress, no kisses abnormal or inappropriate among lovers, as long as it's pleasant for both of them. So obviously, it's also uh, discussing a lot about um, the accessibility to um, to. Uh, to contraception and also um, uh, to uh, legal abortions by uh, comparing the, the, the all time standards when women was more responsible for carrying the baby and therefore being more vulnerable to love relationship and comparing this to Nazi Germany, interestingly, in 1962. I would like to, however, make two points regarding to your book and to findings on sexual education in Poland. For me, what is very important, and you will just show it in your argument from your book, is the story of progress and understanding sex education, as many other issues are not necessarily linear. So for me, very often from my findings, it seems like there is a one step forward and there are one step to the right and one step to back and uh, or left, if you want. So this is fascinating because it also shows or somehow breaks the idea that the 40 years of backwardness of the East were, and following the Westernization or AKA coming back to normality is not necessarily how we should look at these 40 years of backwardness. And that brings me to the second point, and I hope we will discuss it a little bit further in discussion, is this dichotomy of the West and the East. And it, uh, it is definitely interesting, your, your reading of the sources against the Western historical debates, the expert knowledge and developments in West and how it was done, let's call it, in East, and how many interesting findings can come from this, not necessarily comparison, but just showing what was happening in both sides of the world. And this might sound as a cliche or usual academic empty phrase, but I do think that history does matter. And it does help us to understand what is happening in today's societies and where are the roots of certain trends. So Agnieszka's books, I believe, is one of the perfect examples for such writing. So thank you very much. Thank you, Denisa. Uh, and now I would ask uh, Ella to present her comments. So Ella, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I have a couple of, just a couple of slides, but I will ask Jan to share because I have some problems with the, some issues with my computer. 
with the presentations. So just a couple of them, just some uh, examples. And um, so, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, is it okay? If everything works. Jan? Yes, yes. You, you, yeah. every, I think everyone has the slides, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, first of all, I would like to thank Jan and uh, his colleagues for the wonderful uh, history of science in Central Eastern and Southeastern Europe project, the discussion you organized today, and the invitation to speak. Um, and many thanks to Agnieszka for the book, which I read uh, with a great pleasure. Uh, I'm not an, at all an expert on Poland, and I'm actually, as Jan said, writing a dissertation on late Soviet girlhood discourses, uh, mainly based on the sources from the European part of uh, Russian Federation. Uh, but one of the sources uh, with which I started uh, working even before while writing my master's thesis uh, is late Soviet books and manuals on sex education. And in my uh, remark, I would like to share, uh, I would like to say a bit about this Soviet sex education and propose to maybe in our discussion to try to compare Polish and Czechoslovak history of sex education and sexuality debates presented in the Agnieszka book and in Denisa's presentation with the Soviet ones, because I think, I also think these parallels um, and these differences in these histories of sexuality discourse could be quite insightful. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it could be quite insightful if we discuss this non-linearity of the development of the discussion about sexuality, the unapplicability of the concept of progress to the history of sexuality in Central Eastern Europe, and maybe in other countries, actually. Uh, and uh, maybe, mm, you know, comparing with all these old sources with each other, we can actually go further discussing the question about uh, the sex under socialism. Uh, all in all, because, you know, maybe the, the, everyone knows this book uh, by Christian Godsey about uh, uh, women which had better sex under socialism, but she was, um, she wrote about all these matters from a very like economical point of view and we're discussing these courses. Uh, and in this, uh, from this point of view, maybe uh, the story about sex under socialism could be a little bit more difficult. Uh, so uh, I, want, uh, I wanted to start with a short uh, like introduction about sexual education and the whole debate on sexuality, how it developed in the uh, Russian Soviet Republic and the USSR. Uh, and I must say that some fragments of my speech here will be from the draft of my future article for the Northwest Archive Journal, which I'm uh, working, I'm, I'm working on this article right now. So scholars such as Dan Healy or Yelena Zdravomyslova and others usually divide the history of Soviet sexual education and sexuality discourse into three or four stages. Uh, but I believe that maybe we can divide it even in five stages. Is on the camera. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but maybe I think that we can divide it even in five stages, because for me, it seems like the Khrushchev era, the stagnation era, when, you know, the USSR was headed by Brezhnev and Dropov and Chernenko, and the time of glassness were quite different on this matter. So as you can see on the slides, I, I think I... I I would say about five stages of this history. And the first stage uh, is the early Soviet period, 1917, 1920s. It was a time of um, active anti-religious propaganda, forcible secularization of Soviet society and the beginning of social engineering and private life. Some authors describe this time as the first sexual revolution in the USSR. Abortion was legalized, divorce was simplified, homosexuality was decriminalized in these times. Uh, these were the times of experiments and uh, debate on sex and new types of partnerships and families. Uh, however, this debate was quite ambivalent in this essence. Some authors like Eric Nyman argued that sex and relationship was indeed publicly discussed in these times, but 
Already in these times, open sexuality was portrayed in literature and periodicals as bourgeois and something bad. Sometimes this bad was like uh, the rhyme was feminized, like the sex was feminized. Um, so the discourse about sex was quite misogynistic and the female body was associated with capitalism and demonized. Um, so, and it was believed that sexuality should be kind of destroyed, the sexual pleasure uh, should be kind of destroyed for the sake of some other pleasures of the communist revolution and new society, life in a new society. And very bizarre text appeared in these times. For example, uh, there was an article of Professor Martin Biadov in, in the Zvestia newspaper in 1925, and in this article, also said that only under capitalism, women began to have their periods every month, for example, because according to Ladov, before it, people uh, like all animals made it only once a year, but then capitalism came and women became the property of men and they were forced to satisfy them at any time they demanded. So sexuality became kind of dominant emotion of people that was in neutral, as Liadov said, and he believed that uh, under communism, that would not be continued. Um, this article actually was criticized by Soviet health commissar Nikolai Simashka, but it's kind of a very interesting example of how sexuality was actually, even if it was openly discussed, it was kind of demonized at the very beginning, like something and, and associated with capitalism. So these discussions were quite sexophobic from the very beginning, and this is very important. Um, during the second, the Stalinist time, scholarship and discussion about sexuality were almost totally banned. Uh, this period is known for large-scale repressive mobilization of Soviet citizen bodies for the needs of industrialization, military efforts and reproduction, uh, physical military training, hygiene were prompted in the media, in at schools, in the universities, in uh, youth and party organizations, but they and they became a part of so-called Soviet kulturness, which this concept denotes the desirable level of education, culture, manners, body shape, ideological stance of a new Soviet man. However, health, body shape, these all things were disconnected from sexuality, sexual pleasure, uh, and sexuality was discussed as something very decadent even and very unsuitable for new people, new life, for socialism, um, for the new country, social life. Uh, and uh, the most important thing here is that also many psychologists and social scientists who wrote about sexuality before, uh, they were repressed, uh, some of them were killed, and the entire scientific schools were destroyed. Uh, for example, Soviet psychoanalysis, psychotechnics, pedology, right? All these uh, schools. So uh, this whole discuss discourse on sex in the Stalinist time was quite limited to reproduction. Uh, and reproduction was uh, described as one of the duties of, first of all, Soviet women, but also men, of all Soviet citizens, uh, as a kind of form of labor, uh, as something good for the society. Uh, monogamous heterosexual families were regularified, homosexuality was criminalized again, uh, and there was no systematic sexual education for the youth. There was like the idea of education all in all, was pitania, it was very important, but it was not uh, about sex at all. Um, so some, uh, I found the information that some researchers say that even in these times, in the late Stalinist times, actually, there were some books on sexual education published. For example, the manual Healthy Marriage and Healthy Family by actually military Phys uh, physician Lev Zalkin was released in 1948, but they were very, very, uh, they were mostly not about, of course, not about sexual desire or uh, pleasure. They were mostly uh, about, uh, um, you know, uh, like uh, venereal diseases and sex in, the, in this uh, particular book was described quite allegoric, uh, allegorically. Uh, and this book, of course, uh, advocated abstinence. Uh, and again, what, uh, like sexual pleasure, sexuality, 
uh, was not something uh, something good, uh, something positive uh, in this book. Um, so it has a very strong emphasis on abstinence again. Uh, and um, if we move for the uh, after Stalinist, like late Soviet times, um, uh, uh, here we have this Khrushchev era, and it's widely known that uh, it was the times of liberalizations in all spheres of Soviet society, the transition from totalitarianism to autocracy with less violent and repressive and more ideological social engineering tools. And according to some authors like Harkhorn, for example, or Pinsky, the thought brought new ways of disciplining and controlling personal life of Soviet citizens. Uh, for example, this whole tradition of special party meetings at work where a worker, a person uh, could be collectively condemned for uh, unfaithfulness to his wife or notation to his children or like improper sexual life. So this all happened. And this time, the whole series of new books on sexual education appeared. It was late 50s, 60s, and I think it's these books are a great source to investigate the new process of course, this disciplinization of the Khrushchev times. Uh, they were written by Russian authors, but some of them were translated from Czech and German, like uh, the very popular one was the Neubert's book uh, translated from German, it's a GDR author. Um, translated books were less didactic, maybe more informative on some issues which were not addressed in the, by Russian authors. Uh, but still, yes, there were a number of these books in the USSR. Uh, and um, I will ask uh, Jan to show the second slide because there are some examples of how this book looked like. Uh, and what is, uh, what is really interesting is that um, uh, in translated books, which were more open about sexuality, uh, there were editors who tried to neutralize these books a little bit with the uh, right introductions. Uh, and it's interesting how uh, even mm, maybe on a visual uh, level, um, the publishers try to neutralize their like revolutionary meaning, the re revolutionary ideas of these books. Because for example, as you see, many of them were illustrated with the classical paintings. Like, you know, like it, uh, like if you have, uh, like you, they had to make sex less modern uh, to, I don't know, neutralize its revolutionary potential. Yeah, but these books uh, started to be published. And I think it's a very important change. But what is also important about this new discourse on sexuality in the 60s uh, is that in this time, the development of both qualitative studies of families and statistics of marriage, divorce, and childbirth in the USSR started. Um, there were several authors who were making this research. One of them was Sergei Golod. Uh, he was able to familiarize himself with the works of Alfred Kinsey in the late 50s. Uh, and he really wanted to do the same study in the USSR, but there was a center censorship. Uh, so he concentrated on the some specifics of marital relations in Leningrad in the 60s. Uh, and he found out with some other researchers that young couples in the 60s, they do not want to reproduce the gender roles of their parents. Uh, they want to they want do family planning. And he showed that actually uh, there were big shifts in the Soviet society in the 60s, like the divorce was lo losing its stigma. The more and more women were looking for premature sexual experience. Um, and the, the sexual initiation uh, happened more and more earlier. So Dan Healy, for example, the researcher on Soviet and pre-Soviet sexuality, he described these changes in the Soviet society as well as this appearance of new professional discourses about sex in the late Soviet times as a kind of Soviet sexual revolution of the 60s and 70s, like the second Soviet sexual revolution, hidden one, but still uh, a sexual revolution. Uh, and yeah, what is also important to say uh, that in these times also medical research on sexuality reappeared uh, in the form, it was in institutionalized in the form of sexopathology and Agnieszka actually mentioned it in her book that it was a specifics of Soviet medical discourse on sex, but still 
in the USSR, medical doctors and also social researchers, they started directly calling for social education for the youth. And what is also important about all this is that all this literature on sex, which appeared in the 60s, 70s, and then uh, in the 80s, um, uh, it still had an idea, almost all these books had an idea that sexuality uh, requires control, first of all, and highly moral culture. And then uh, if you want to save young people from venereal diseases, uh, allow them to be happy, to build happy families, to be happy in a collective, to be good workers, first of all, uh, we have to uh, teach them how to con control themselves, how to uh, practice abstinence also. Uh, and so this official discourse on sex and this discourse in the research was quite sexophobic still and quite fragmented. For example, of course, homosexuality, which remained criminalized in this time, was almost not discussed or discussed exclusively as something negative. Uh, and sex still was used primarily in the context of reproduction. Uh, and later in the stagnation times, it remains it remained, uh, but the whole discourse about the relationship became even more conservative because there was like a small uh, conservative turn uh, in the discourse about uh, gender in these times. So in the 70s, in the 80s, uh, the ideas of femininity and masculinity, which a few decades earlier were proclaimed old fashioned, they started to be cultivated again. And uh, uh, the hierarchical relationship between women and men uh, this idealized image of quite conservative hierarchical families with children, they began to appear in, me in media. And, uh, you know, some authors started to write that it's it's an ideal, it's what we have to come back to, because we maybe we uh, did, like, we made our society too equal. It's not good uh, for women and men. They It may make them unhappy. Uh, so, yeah, this all also appeared in books on sexual education and uh, uh, you know this ideal of a great family hierarchical family um, it actually was described again uh, avoiding describing the sex act and sexual pleasure and uh, so this thing remained uh, and we had almost no authors which will uh, write like Vietslav Sokoluk, right, about pleasure. Uh, we had Igor Kohn, though, but uh, he could not publish. He, he had these ideas from the 60s and 70s that it's important to talk about pleasure also, but he could not publish this thing. He started publishing his books and articles on this matter only, as I remember, in the 80s, 90s. Um, so, and in this very specific form, um, sexual education was institutionalized in 19. 84 in Soviet Union, after long discussions, it turned into a special 34 hours course for Soviet school children in grades nine to 10. It's like teenagers of 16, 17 years old. The course was called Ethics of Ethics and Psychology of Family Life. And it prompted pronatalist sex roles in the future family in gender relations. Uh, and uh, this course, uh, there were a lot of debate about this course because teachers were not really prepared to, to teach this. So it was like the, a whole bunch of problems with this course. So it was actually then uh, annulled in the late 1980s. Uh, and in the late 1980s, after the advent of glassness, like anti-censorship policy, uh, after Gorbachev's large-scale large economic, social, and political reforms, uh, foreign films and books began to appear in the USSR, uh, and uh, some forbidden writings began to, to be published uh, also on the sex uh, about sex, and um, the whole like governmental like main discourse on sexuality started uh, it, it started to have some uh, uh, like it started to compete with other discussions and trends so that was like the whole uh, new uh, period and uh, sorry I think yeah I thought it was too long I'm so sorry uh, just uh, uh, I don't have time for the most important part which is like my ideas about how we can compare Polish and Czechoslovak material with Soviet one, but I will still try to shortly say a few words about it. So if we compare these processes which took place in the 20th century in Poland and the USSR, we can see that, of course, 
they were in many ways quite different and the timing in some cases was quite different and you know it seems like Poland had in some periods uh, much more liberalized authors writing about sex and sexuality and pleasure and uh, you know um, providing this information to the youth uh, but what is very interesting for me if we compare these different uh, societies, these different histories of sexuality, and what is uni what unites both Soviet and some parts of Polish discourse about sex, is this very strong accent on abstinence and self-control needed in one's sex life. And in Poland, as I understood, this the primary provider of this discourse was the Catholic Church, right? Uh, and some individual authors. Uh, but in the USSR and Russian Soviet Republic, the religion was banned, right? And it's interesting that it was the state who started controlling, censoring, and shaping the debates on the sexuality, and it started shaping it in a very similar way, in a way uh, where, you know, you have to control your desires, you have to control, you have to not to think about pleasure uh, uh, if you want to be also a good person, it's a very, it was a very moral discussion. Uh, it's also a big, very big difference because as I understood in Poland, in Czechoslovak, there were researches like empirical research where of uh, sexual life of people. And in Soviet Union, the whole discussion about sexuality, not marriage, but sexuality itself, it was very much in them. It was very much about, uh, it was more about morality and it was, uh not it had no such an empirical base so there, there was a whole discipline which is called co communist morality uh and um, from like in like this the authors from this the, uh, discipline they started also to write about sexuality in the 60s and 70s so yeah this is this is the difference but that's interesting how state in the ussr and church in the in poland came like to the same idea, to like even the same metaphors as I understood about sex. Uh, and how it's interesting that I think that this, this uh, view on sex, sexual life, uh, is very much what shaped what we have in, so, uh, in contemporary Russia, this uh, whole anti-gender, anti-gay sentiment, ideology, uh, this whole discussion about non-traditional and traditional sex life and relationships. And again, that's interesting how many common uh, points it has with the contemporary Poland, right? In, for example, Hungary, but uh, in this case, we discuss uh, Polish material. So yeah, um, I think that's all my material for today. I'm sorry that yeah, it was too long, uh, and I would be happy to discuss uh, to discuss uh, all these cases uh, with you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Ella, for this very detailed uh, overview of what was happening in the Soviet Union. Uh, so now, Agnieszka, you can uh, react to to Denise's and Ella's comments. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Denise and Ella, for all those kind words. Uh, that was um, the Thanks a lot. That, that that really means a lot to hear it from both of you. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I will reply briefly because I can see that we have this really amazing audience with major experts in the field, uh, and I'm sure that they will have some more uh, more to add to this. So I don't want to take all the time. But you know, starting with the very last point, um, Ella did on this comparison between the Polish Catholic Church and the Soviet state. I think it, it also, I, I would just would like to build on this because I think it goes deeper because it also decentralized what you are saying. It, and it also, if we add Czechoslovakia to this in which there were kind of similar processes and especially in the 1970s, the whole concept of uh, you know good sexuality as happening in in marriage and in marriage with traditional gender roles, that that would be very, very, um, very similar for Poland and Czechoslovakia. So I think this comparatism really decentralized the Catholic Church in Poland. It's saying that this this idea perhaps were not purely Catholic ideas, but they were also in a way this uh, uh, this kind of 
you know that that was uh, that was this kind of uh, idea of Catholic morality and and the concept that that uh, that sexuality that you know sexuality is something capitalists uh, and bourgeois and and something wrong which is interesting because if we look at discourses in the west uh, you know all this free love and everything that will be something communists and that's why bad so so i think that, that you know it also opens up for east west uh, uh, division but 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 I think that that you know putting putting these things to, together and and also making comparison between Poland today and Russia and Hungary, for instance, with all this you know panic around gender ideology or LGBT ideology or gayness or whatever it's called in various contexts. So 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 this thing also so is is it is it like only the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church that are behind this, or maybe this is a part of a broader cultural construction that that it was built up through the entire 20th century and from the complicated complicated uh, history of of the region, but also not only about the region because I think some some of the things we could also see in the so-called West, which also cannot be seen as a monolithic uh, space. But I had a, a presentation book discussion in Edinburgh a few weeks ago, and people started to sharing their uh, their experiences with sex education in the UK, which were also kind of similar to conservative teachers not being really prepared and being shy and everything. And even even uh, there are this research showing that even in in this you know the best place of sex education in Sweden, teachers are not really prepared for that. So, so I think sex education is this really difficult topic that uh, each government and each system has a has a problem with and place it somewhere else, <laughs> you know, push it, oh, this is, this is bad because it's capitalist, this is bad because it's communism, this is bad because it's, it's uh, secular or demoralizing and so on. So I think it really shows how central this issue is and how how po political it is. So so I think that that's one thing to, in in reference to Ella's uh, talk. But also I think if if we look what you also said on on the the second sex revolution in Russia, it was very much expert revolution. Uh, there, there there's a huge role of experts, and so it is in Poland, and so it is in Czechoslovakia. I think. So, so also this period of in the 1970s, I think there's a common trend that that experts are important figures, uh, important agents of change here. So, uh, so that was uh, that was one thing. And I, I thank you so much for this for this example uh, that this was under capitalism that women started to menstruate regularly. That's that's a very nice. <laughs> very nice example and then and then then coming back to to, to Denise's comment thanks thanks again uh, for them so you ask about uh, peasants and you know the the rural urban and yes this this is something that that you know this divisions and the idea that that there are uh, uh, urban uh, uh, the urban elite thinking about the countryside as the space uh, that is usually backwarded, that there is no space for any, I know, sexual diversity. Uh, I think it's it's still really common, common way of thinking, thinking about it uh, in Poland. And perhaps uh, my book could be could be criticized uh, for uh, showing, I mean, to, you know, uh, showing, uh, uh, showing the, the countryside as even, you know, more progressive than it really was, but I, I really wanted to be for for the Polish audience. I really wanted to be provocative, and to 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 say that you know that look there were a lot going on, and then there were those Polish or Slovak uh, Slovak um, folklorists who collected all those songs folk songs about sexuality, which are open. They were very open uh, about it and very diverse also. And they censor censor them, not the church, not the uh, not the state, but you know, but uh, just early ethnographers who did that. Uh, of course, working for you know certain ideas about the state and the nation and so on. 
So I think that that's really uh, that's really important uh, important point. And I think that that what what uh, all what you both of you said and what my book is also doing is that really the deconstruction of this idea of East West and and the catch up thing that there's this, some kind of uh, backwarded narrative. And I've been I have this feeling that we've been talking about this. I mean, as anthropologists or historians working on Eastern Europe has been talking about this for the last at least, I don't know, 15 years. But this is the narrative which still comes back all the time. Uh, and it, in both the East and the West, that, that people, this is how people think about it, that there's certain progress and cer certain things that we should cut up with. And, uh, and although there are so many research showing that, that this is not true, <laughs> uh, then this keeps coming back. So uh, yeah, so I think uh, I think maybe uh, we can uh, either if you want to respond or, or, and as I'm saying that there are so many great people in the audience, so I don't want to talk too much. If uh, there's yeah, uh, are we opening for the uh, audience or? I would say I would say yes. We can uh, sorry open for the audience. So so basically, if you have questions, please uh, either write or comments <laughs> or, or comments. Yes, or uh, some comparatism from other countries. I can I can see specialists in Hungary and Germany, Spain. So if exactly. there's so anyone, all all comments are, are welcome. So basically, please write a. Q or raise a hand. Uh, so yeah, basically every, everything so that we can see that you want to ask a question. Oh, I have uh, already Michael talk, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Can, can you all hear me? Yes. Very important question nowadays. Uh, thank, uh, thank you for, for your presentation and the two comments on it. Um, I just wanted to stress one thing I think is most important. It's this uh, transnational aspect, uh, especially um, in, in, this, in this regard, because I think everyone was looking at everyone, no, not only east on east, but also east on west. It is uh, clearly observable. When you look at the uh, preparation courses of the Catholic uh, of the clubs of the uh, Catholic intelligentsia, they had stuff from France, from Italy, from Western Germany, and I think the more important is, uh, let's say, the ideological background uh, where the the original authors were from, if they uh, were compatible with uh, the the uh, uh, the experts in in the country we are we are talking about. And uh, this East-West, I think it's it's not so important as it seems to be, especially from the 1970s on, where where we know there was different things and so on, and there were cultural uh, contexts. Um, but I have one special, very special question uh, to Agnieszka, and it, it's this problem of okay, we have we have plans to introduce preparation courses, preparation for families in Poland from the 1960s onwards, and nothing really happened. Yeah, there were some, uh, some schools, some experimental courses, and nothing happened. And then in the 80s, we, uh, we have the, this clash about this, uh, this handbook and so on. And uh, looking in, in a longer perspective, I asked myself, why? What are the factors that hindered uh, the introduction of this specific subject? Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, and I think maybe I should I should say that thank you so much for writing the review of the book uh, when it was uh, published in Polish, and uh, this is one of the reviews in English. Yes, that was you uh, who wrote the review, and one of these reviews published in English made the book uh, to be translated into English. So that was uh, thanks to Michał among other people that the book is available to in English, and also thanks to Agata, who's also here. Uh, so yeah, so why? I mean, <laughs> this is, this is the, the biggest question. Why 
it always fails, right? That's the, that's the question. But I think that the, 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 the short answer would be that it fails because it's not about uh, young people, but it's about the state and the, the concept the, uh, and nationalism. So it cannot be left to you. You can. I think that's the the the, the revolutionary thing, and especially when when Ella was talking about um, about uh, the USSR, the revolutionary thing about Sokolov and his handbook from the late eighties was that he said, "Well, young people, here you have all the knowledge, and you do whatever you feel. But this is this is your life and your decision." So that was the most revolutionary thing. Not the positions, not everything, but just saying that there are young people who could decide what they want to do. And this is this is, this was like move from the level of the nation to the level of um, uh, just young people experiences. So I think so so, so I think even perhaps uh, there would be we could write another book about uh, trying to answer your question. <laughs> but I think the short a strong answer would be that this, that these issues are just so crucial for other things, not for young people themselves, but for for how how do we imagine uh, the state and uh, I mean the state and the nation, you know, doing this um, uh, distinction between the state and the nation that it's in Slavic languages and not necessarily in English, but I think everybody here um, understands the, the difference, the Slavic difference <laughs> between the two. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, we need more research. <laughs> yes, definitely. Uh, so, Julia Moore? Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm a uh, master's student right now in the United States. Um, and my advisor actually recommended that I attend this talk, and it's been really informative. So, thank you guys for helping it. Um, right now, as far as um, I'm in the first year of my program and determining my thesis, I'm interested in really questions of Polish nationalism and gender. Um, I've so far studied women during the Second World War and how they played, um, and now I'm moving into the post-war period, um, looking at questions of state building and maintaining Polish identity under socialist control. So I was wondering, it was mentioned briefly in your talk, I was wondering if you could speak more about how family planning and sexuality fits into the Nationalist Poland um, project and how you see that defining statehood and things like that. Well, okay, so this is another <laughs> another huge, huge question. Thank you so much. And I'm really glad that there is uh, some interest in uh, among students in the US, although the Cold War is over <laughs> and we still have, there's still some interest. So thanks so much for, for, for your general interest in, in Poland and, and especially in gender issues. So, so, so I think that, that there is this, uh, this, um, uh, this concept that connects the church and the state. It's res responsibility that, that both of them were, and this also translates into nationalism were quite uh, pro uh, and but at the same time would also also were a little bit Malthusian in the sense that you know you, you should have children more than one but not too many not not more than you can really support and you can take care of so so you know like reckless reproduction wouldn't be good and even even on the um, in Catholic sources, there was this idea that you should be responsible about uh, about procreation. So I think responsibility and, res and responsibility uh, is also the title. Love and responsibility is the title of John John Paul II when before he became pope by Paolo Tewa, major book on sexuality, um, uh, where where he also talks about how you should be really responsible about family planning, about uh, love, about marriage. So this this things uh, so and then th this connects to what uh, what Ella was talking about uh, about the Soviet Union, how much control is uh, is important, and it also explains why this this progressive handbook from the 1980s was banned from school because it's it also was talking about the, that you should be responsible, but you should be responsible in your own terms, not not for the sake of of the nation, 
or the church or whatever, but just do whatever you feel will be good for you. So that was like very, so I think that's responsibility, which is very much com, uh, like uh, societal or, you know, community oriented, nation oriented. That's something that that's here, I think plays very uh, the crucial role when it comes to family planning uh, on a like broader abstract, in broader abstract terms, not necessarily on like everyday basis. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, may I just add a little bit? It's just um, it's so interesting that uh, in Soviet sources, I also didn't have, I didn't see this national idea of na nation and that you have to like have children for a nation, but there was the whole, it was bigger, you know, that was the whole idea that you have to have children and to control your sexual lives for the communist future, you know, that you have to, like there was this author, Kobanovsky, who wrote the introduction to the Neubert's translation, to the translation of uh, Rudolf Neubert's book uh, from German into Russian. And he was saying like, uh, very seriously, he was saying that uh, there are, there is some research which shows that if you don't control your sexual, uh, your sexuality, you become uncontrolled, you can't work, you can't normally socialize with people. And this all, you know, affects our society all in all. So you have to control yourself, but at the same time, you have to have a nice family, which also is important for a, for a family. So it's like, you have to like, let your sexuality, I, I of course uh, speculate a little bit, but the idea is that you have to let your sexuality for the society only in the very specific uh, moments of time uh, and then stop it and, you know, concentrate on labor, on creativity and like that what, uh, uh, you know, in psychoanalysis, uh, it would say sublime, but in Soviet Union psychoanalysis was banned. So it was not said in these terms, but it was actually very close. But it was not about nation, it was about this whole utopian project. But you know, but Poland has its own national way to socialism, like the Polish way to socialism. So it was just the same, but differently uh, named. I mean, simplifying. I can see Lutz having uh, his hand. Our, you know, German specialist in German sex education. Thanks so much for um, joining us. Yeah, thank you. Um, fascinating stuff. Um, I, I, I don't really have a question. Maybe, maybe I'm allowed to, to, to make a short comment um, on, on, on comparison. Um, um, what, what Ella presented, I found that extremely interesting. Um, and I can only emphasize that it's a similar um, um, parallel between East and, and West German sex education. Um, uh, and, and really from a slight, very different perspective of religion and, and state socialism in the 1950s and well into the 1960s. Um, and you can see, you know, it, they, they, they sort of talk about similar uh, sexual, morality, sexual morality and, and similar um, notions of, of premarital abstinence and similar positions um, about contraception and so on and so forth. It's only that sort of the justification in West Germany uh, comes from a, a return sort of to, to Christian values of, of, of Christian concept of family and, and, and marriage. Um, and um, yes, and mainly and mainly, you know, influenced by by um, by, by, by Catholic uh, um, um, ideas uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, whereas in the GDR, it, it was sort of this, this idea of the new socialist uh, um, 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 human being, um, you know, with in, in the 1958, um, Ulbricht um, released the Ten Commandments of the New Socialist Human, uh, and that included in, I can't remember exactly which command it was, it was number six, but it says you need to honour um, um, a family, and you need to leave a decent and and clean life. Um, well, of course, it refers to, to to your sexual life. Um, so this was sort of the the the, the, the principles her young people, um, not only young people but young people as well, had to adhere to. Um, 
so that that is one observation which I found very interesting, and it was interesting, Ella, from what you said that you see that uh, confirmed when you compare Poland and, and the Soviet Union. A brief remark on Neubert. Um, I just tried to figure out which which of his books it was. So it, I, I suppose it was um, his his uh, book from the nine, 1955 that was translated into Russian in 1971. Um, and by that time, Neubert had very much moved on um, as, as sex education in, in the GDR has moved on from the principles of the 1950s. So it's interesting that they translated not one of the newer publications uh, from the GDR, uh, sex education books, but they went back to the one from 1955. So that, that, that is interesting. If, if it was that book, um, how do I tell my child um, um, if, if it was that one? Um, I, I, there actually, in the end, there were several books of Neuber translated and it was for sure the new book on marriage. It was the first one, I think. Uh, and also, uh, I don't remember, sorry, the name, um, but one of, of them was uh, for youth specifically. So I think maybe it's uh, some of him, his later books, actually. So, so I just have you want to, to re uh, react to the comment? Or? Uh, no, I think it was a general comment. Do you want Lutz, Do you want me to to say something? Yeah, the, I mean, thanks so much for this. Uh, so, to bringing uh, in German, East-West German perspective, because I think it also uh, illuminates all other cases. So, yeah. I mean, then, then maybe I, I would have a question because we were talking about exactly nationalism and the. the uh, the, the, the utopic projects uh, as points of reference, uh, but I actually wanted to say what to ask what, what were the, the transnational points of reference for the uh, for the Soviet Polish discourse, uh, because uh, I mean we, we, we do have uh, as as we already heard uh, in a way a very transnational community which is uh, like people referring to each other and knowing each other. Uh, but knowing and referring doesn't actually, I mean, there is also like framing. And I think the Ella's example uh, shows it very clearly that we have a German author, but who, he's framed in a very, very specific way. And it's also a very specific book which is taken. So it's like uh, a, a bit of delay in this. Uh, so there is like, it's, it's not a, it's, it's, it's still a transnational community, but there is still a lot of, I mean, uh, very, state specific in it. Uh, and exactly, I wanted to, uh, to ask whether you could, could reflect a bit exactly on this uh, transnational specificity of the Polish example. Well, so I think uh, Poland, uh, I think it goes both, way, both, both, both ways, east and west. <laughs> so, so there is a lot of interest in, uh, in, Amer in, in what's going on in the US. So Kinsey and then Masters and Johnson are very much, uh, you know, quoted authors and maybe not sex education for 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 schools, but more broad, more broadly for like uh, various, you know, expert publication on on sexuality. So, so for instance, there are all those books in which you can really learn a lot about Kinsey's uh, Kinsey's research. Uh, and Masters and Johnson are, you know, quoted a lot uh, in all sorts of, uh, including the, the uh, it, I mean, not directly, but the concepts of sexuality appear even in the sex education book, uh, uh, the, the one from the 80s that only lasted uh, two months. So, so that's uh, that's the um, uh, that's one point of reference. Then there's Czechoslovakia. So there's a lot of collaboration between between um, Polish people from you know broadly defined Planned Parenthood circles and Czechoslovak um, psychotherapists. It's 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 really especially liked and admired. As a you know, as a therapist and also a marriage marriage therapist. So 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 there is this. Generally, uh, Soviet scholars are quoted, but not necessarily um, 
there's there's not so much genuine interest in what's going on in the USSR. Uh, although from what you were saying, <laughs> there are quite a lot of similarities. So, so I think maybe maybe they only pretended that they were not so interested. And there's also there's also interest in um, in classical German uh, uh, or German speaking countries, not necessarily. Uh, current, I mean, current, I mean, not necessarily uh, socialist uh, German authors, um, it's, it's German authors, but more about, you know, uh, classics of uh, of sexology, uh, like Kraft Ebbing or uh, Magnus Fisch, and, and so on. So, you know, so not only from Germany, but also from Austria and all the circles there. But at the same time, and I think that this also brings us to what uh, what Den uh, Denisa was talking about. But there's also huge interest in Kama Sutra, and and even among Catholic authors, uh, Kama Sutra is presented as something that that's really creative and um, should be advised for ca Catholic couples. That's in one of the Catholic manuals in the, from the 1970s. So so. And then there is a lot of discussions around things like, um, you know, sexuality in the East. So, so the, some kind of Orientalist discourse around sexuality that would come come in into like uh, newspapers, uh, youth newspaper, news, uh, news, uh, sorry, youth magazines, and so on. So, so I think that that will be a lot of uh, a lot of levels. And then, and then you know, people travel, uh, scholars travel to the West, brought, brought books. And so, so I think that, that there is way more exchange that we could, uh, uh, we could imagine. And, and conferences, and especially, especially with just our colleagues, there were con conferences and meetings and so on. Thank you. Uh, I, see, I see now uh, Dietlin Kutko. We saw you for a second. <laughs> uh, yeah, I oh. see. I, I'm... Hello. No, hello. <laughs> yeah, now we see you. Ah, uh, I don't see me myself, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't need but to maybe, see myself. Maybe that's, yeah, maybe, uh, they're saying that this this is bad for our brain to see ourselves on yeah. all the time <laughs> on the screen, so good for you. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for this inspiring talk from all of you three. I would like to know something about uh, to ask um, on the educated, and um, I I would like to know more about whether it is only only I will be a, a bit um, dichotomic, only a discourse between experts, and um, they are interested in all these expert um, literature and um, other experts in other countries and. Or whether there is something about what about the educated um, the, the persons who are addressed, or maybe it is something about the edu education between experts, and not about pe about the youngsters, but about um, uh, education between experts, or maybe it has to do, uh, or it, um, or what? Yeah, what about the educated? I agreed to all these things about uh, nation and family and. Um, uh, discipline and so on, but nevertheless, maybe you have some hints what educated did with this information they got. You mean like young people who got yes. this? Yes, young, young people, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you. Thanks so much for this question because that's the essential question. Uh, yeah, so, so, you know, as I said, part of my, you know, my major source were the letters young people, uh, young people sent to, uh, to sex educators. And there are letters from various various moments. So, uh, so I think uh, what you, and and sometimes because some of the some of the letters I got I got from uh, from Wiesław Sokolov, from the author of this most progressive Polish book. So he kept he was like really good in in uh, putting everything in order. So he would have uh, letters he received, copies of the answers he sent, and sometimes there were letters sent again to him. So there was like exchange. And from from what you can see there, it's um, 
I think uh, here again is this, this term of responsibility. So young people were really eager to learn, and and then you you see, and also in in letters that are being printed in the press and never in magazines that that this knowledge was really getting to them so they they and even in letters they would use this really specialized uh, language uh, you know some terms they would learn in in medical books and and what's and what's uh, what's really interesting that they they and then another source i used and that was also from from Wiesław Sokolov was he he traveled from school to school in in the late 70s and in the in the 80s and later in the 90s he he traveled all all around poland and did sex education lessons and and before he would come he he would ask uh, you know that uh, that somebody would collect questions from young people so he would prepare accordingly. So I had all those questions uh, 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 he was asked. So so I think that that uh, if you are asking what they were doing with this, so they definitely listened and they wanted to have to they wanted more information. So so and then there's a lot of a lot of letters. For instance, I read your book or I read your article, and you are saying this and that. And then I was, I'm wondering how this translates into my situation and my situation is this and that. So they really wanted more. And I think what's really striking and that's why I think sex education is such an important issue now if we are moving to the idea of public anthropology or public history is that these questions are again the same in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 80s, in the 90s, of, of course, they are in uh, today they are framed differently because, of course, uh, the language uh, uh, evolves, and that you know there's there's HIV AIDS now, which wasn't earlier. There were other, but you know, but the questions, the general thing young people want to know is the same: where, where when is the good moment to start? Uh, how not to get pregnant? What about you know sexual orientation and gender identity? These are the things they want to know. Basically, the the and masturbation. That's that's a huge issue. So this this five things they want to know and uh, and they want more. So they want really details, not only what's in those really sometimes very encrypted descriptions in sex education books. Because then I didn't say this. The title of my book about uh, seeing a moose is that. This is a story from one of the sex education books, which wasn't about sex, this is what Ella was talking about, but it was about how to see a moose, like an actual, uh, actual, you know, moose in the forest. Not a meta, not a metaphor. <laughs> like this, just, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, since we are in the, some of us are in the history of science, I, I wanted actually also Denisa and Ella to, to maybe uh, re respond to the, the to Dietlin's question, because that, that's also very interesting for me, to, to which extent we have the, let's say, scholarly habit, differences in scholarly habitus, uh, in this case, uh, between the experts, or we, or we don't, maybe. Uh, so Denisa, Ella, do, can you also say something about the actors, recipients, uh, agency, and possibilities to influence the, the discussions? I would, I would oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, just you start, please. OK, now we are too polite to each other, so <laughs> I will start. Um, it really depends at the time of the, of, of, of the periodization. So I was looking at the let's say the Slovak sex education throughout 1980s until 1965. And it depends who is writing at the different times. So for me, the most interesting people who were the actors were in the interwar period when there is a collection of everybody basically. And the most interesting people writing about sex ed are for me the people who are basically businessmen and they see what we see today, sex is selling. So people were writing self-made uh, books, uh, um, pretending that it was written by some sort of a doctor, but it was anonymously written by 
by the, the businessman basically and also very vague um, um, advice is giving and then we have a lot of uh, letters as well in the Slovak case and this is uh, at the wartime Slovakia and this is all the time when the, the Catholicism is way stronger so advices are very different and this is usually given to women and um, so for me, most interesting part of it is um, the whole sex education um, is more related to women, especially when, when addressing the marital life, because the whole happiness of a marital life is supposed to be sort of on the, on the shoulders of a woman. And she is fully responsible for anything connected to, to happiness in the in a relationship. Later on, it looked different when we are talking about divorces, for example, from 1950s and 1960s, that women are actually divorcing because they are not really happy in a relationship and because the man is not doing what he's supposed to do. But that's a different story. Um, but the, the recipients, when um, um, that I, I can't tell you that exactly as Agnieszka can tell you. Uh, what I can see is usually women being just very politely thinking that it did help or it didn't help or if it could be developed any further. That's more or less. Thank you, and Ella? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I must say that I haven't studied uh, the recipients of sex education in the late Soviet Union. Uh, so I now i'm working with the girls diaries from the 60s 70s 80s and they i mean from what i've read i have quite a lot of materials so i've just started working with it uh, girls do not write about it uh, the teenage girls they uh, in my materials they don't reflect this as fear as maybe it was uh, difficult for them to discuss it to to think about it even in their own diaries but maybe i will find something in the future uh, but I have uh, something to say about the habitus of the researchers, about those people who were doing sex education in the late Soviet Union. And this is a very interesting thing. Uh, I wrote my master's degree about one of these educators. His name is Viktor Kobanovsky. And the thing is that he's a very interesting figure. Uh, and I think very symptomatic because he started with empirical work in the 20s. He was a medical doctor. He started doing, uh, he was involved in experiments on the twins, uh, something connected with, I think, genetics. I don't remember in details. But the thing is that uh, during the Stalinist time, he shifted. He stopped doing uh, empirical work. Uh, he somehow avoided repressions, but he became a manager, like the uh, administrator. He became a head of the institute. Uh, uh, of psychology. And uh, from the Stalinist time, he started writing more theoretical, I would say, works like, and he was writing about a lot of different things, like he was a specialist in communist moral. Uh, that's what I said, that some of these educators, they came from the this very, how is it called in English, very uh, not grounded empirical like far from empirical materials discussions about morality and communism so you know in the late they started writing these things in the stalinist time and later they somehow shifted to the sex education uh so yeah he was writing about morality uh he was doing lectures about it and he also in the uh, war times he somehow started working on the war psychology and strategy i still don't understand what he what he wanted to say about it and uh, then he was working on the psychology of religion so he was was actually very much he tried to be very um he tried to do things which are fashionable like in the soviet times and uh, so in the 60s he came to sex education. It's very interesting that the person with such a background, he was a communist, he became, a, 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 he started, um, he, when he was uh, still at school, he became a communist and he was very involved in the revolution. And he was like, uh, uh, very, like, I mean, he was pro-state a, a lot, uh, pro-governmental. And uh, yeah, that's that was a person who, one of the person who started writing about sex and starting saying that it's important to tell young people about sexuality to protect them, of course, to protect them, but it's important to tell them about this. So, um, 
So yeah, I think you had to have quite a lot of statues to do this in the late Soviet times. Uh, but what is also interesting is that some of the specialists like Kobonovsky, they actually started with the things which were banned then. Like he was interested in psychoanalysis. He was involved in empirical research. He was connected with some schools which were banned. And then in the sex education and he revived some of this knowledge from the very early stages of his career. So it's like, it's like, it's about um, how it's, Actually, it's also about how it's connected with the early Soviet times, but not very directly. So you like, but this, I think these people who did sexual education in the late Soviet times, they had this connection and this connection was very important that also make them do this, uh, inter made them interested in this, in these topics. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> can I can I add one more thing to uh, what I said earlier? Because I think this the, this question did uh, uh, um, ask is like the really crucial one. <laughs> so if I can just just add the uh, just briefly two examples. So so uh, you know how how this knowledge was received. So for instance, I I interviewed. Uh, uh, senior uh, gay uh, gay man about uh, how they read uh, sex education materials back in the 70s. So, for instance, they would say, "Well, and the, we have a whole uh, you know big grand, big research team, so everybody was asking about this." And quite a few people said, "Oh, there was this green book which was really good." So I was like, "What kind of green book? Nobody could remember the name." But as I've been working on these issues for quite a while, I, I have a lot of uh, sex communist books uh, at home and, you know, everybody are bringing them to me. So I went through all the books and I found the green book and the green book is by 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 by, a pol by the Polish sexologist, the, one of the major Polish sexologists, Kazimierz Imieliński, and it has an entire chapter on Kinsey. Uh, you know, explaining, uh, you know, revolutionary uh, finding, King says revolutionary funding when it comes to homosexuality, how, how, of, how, you know, common it is and so on. So, so I think that people were really, and then another, uh, uh, within this, the same series of interview, a woman told me how she was too afraid of uh, a, les uh, a lesbian. She told me how she was too afraid to, to buy a book and to take it from a library, to borrow it from a library. So she would go to a bookstore and read it somewhere, you know, so just read one page at a time and then come back so nobody could figure out that she's interested in the book. So people are really eager to, 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 to learn about it. And the other thing was censorship. So homosexuality wasn't really so accepted in the 1970s. So you couldn't write um, directly uh, in a the pathologizing fashion. So some experts would write, well, treatment is possible and effective, but in other countries, for instance, there are those places, there are those special cafes and magazines and this research, like Kinsey research and so on. So, so I think that there was a lot of interaction between the readers and the experts and sex educators and also through the, through the letters. So yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so so uh, I would invite the, the last question, if there is one. Uh, I'm looking around at uh, these faces I, that I see and also at the, the chat. Uh, if not, then maybe I, I will ask like very final question because like, uh, now, now, because we are talking a lot about the official uh, literature. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to ask uh, to which extent there was a gray literature uh, in Sami's that concerning with sex education uh, in all these three cases that we're today talking about. Well, there were so many Polish books published on sex that, <laughs> that you needed, you didn't need so much Sami's that, but of course, in the 1980s, there are first gay magazines. Uh, and there is, you know, home homemade pornography. That so so there are some kind of unofficial uh, spaces, and I think the very interesting unofficial space would be um, art, like not uh, 
not the official art, but uh, but uh, avant-garde, uh, often very nice space which would really experiment with sexuality. Like for instance, Natalia Lel was one of the major the very early feminist uh, feminist artist in Poland, and she did a lot, uh, pro a lot of projects around sexuality, and some of them were not uh, shown until many years later, not so publicly, but of course her friends and her circles would would see it, and then there there's a lot of play with sexuality in visual arts of the 1970s, but this 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 films or photos were just really for a very, very limited uh, limited audience. So so I think that that there were some spaces. I think this is one of the places we can uh, continue research to 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 find uh, those unofficial spaces of sexual emancipation that would go beyond certain model, which I think was dominant in the free countries <laughs> and to some extent still is. Thank you. So from the Slovak slash Czechoslovak case, um, if we talk just about the uh, um, state socialism, then uh, and some is that there, I wouldn't necessarily call it some is that it was more something what you already mentioned about this shyness of buying a book or getting it from the library, and it was, was more like making a copy, so writing a notes from the books, which was the more int most interesting part, and this is really literally among the teenagers, or was among adults, which we could we, again we can't really call it some is that where it was basically uh, sharing and spreading the somehow acts, not necessarily pornography, but some pictures which was not allowed to be uh, distributed, but there will be a naked man slash naked woman. But as a sum is that I'm not sure, but this is indeed an interesting, interesting point where it could be um, developed further. I would be also thinking if the Catholic Catholics would be more interesting in writing something more um, conservative at the time of 1950s, 1960s, because 1960s would be actually quite liberal um, in Czechoslovak writing. And I think that would be pretty, um, I would say, sufficient for the teenagers at that time, not necessarily in the books for them, but the, in the books for their parents, which I'm clearly sure that they would definitely read it if possible. So, but as a sum is that it could be interesting to go a little bit deeper into it as the research. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I, I've, when I was talking, I've been thinking about the same thing that uh, to what extent you could see some conservative uh, sources that we can see at the, uh, we can see that, for instance, uh, anti-abortion uh, things were, were censored. They couldn't be published if, if they use uh, terms like, you know, killing the unborn, this is something that couldn't be published. So, so yeah, so that's another space, I think, also in Poland. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ella, do you want to add something about the subject? I just wanted to say that I haven't uh, studied the Samizdat's uh, 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 erotics or pornography, but there were, there were I, I know that there were uh, erotics, there were Kama Sutra in some as that in Soviet Union, but I haven't studied it, but I've read uh, just uh, as a final, I don't know, sketch. I've read uh, the recollections of one of the so uh, one uh, Soviet writer, and he said that if you wanted to know more about sex uh, or maybe find some pornography, you had to go to the train, to the train between, uh, you know, cities, so it's called Elektrichka, right? And there were people, they were called Belarusians, and nobody knows why, but it was their name, like that was their kind of nickname for them. And uh, if you find these people, you could ask them, and they had like a lot of pornog pornography photos in their, uh, you know, uh, in their coats, so you could buy it in the train, but you had to go to the train. <laughs> The, the, the Russian electricals, <laughs> very romantic place. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, since, since I don't see, see any, any more questions, uh, then uh, maybe Agnieszka, do you want to have a final, final statement? Yeah, I, yes. Um, yes, I want to have a final statement, but it's just uh, to say thank you 
Bian for organizing this and Denisa and Ella for for your comments and kind words and to this we really have amazing audience uh, I think everybody's so tired uh, of zoom so thanks so much everybody for for you know joining and I think that the, the only regret is that we are not uh, meeting in Prague now in person and we cannot go for with this nice uh, tag beer that we all miss I think something and I hope uh, the future will bring some you know better times in which we can have a, a real beer or the nice dinner we had in Brussels with Lutz a few years ago. Thank you Agnieszka and thank you Denisa and, and Ella for, for great uh, comments and great, great presentation and also thank you all for, uh, for questions and for being with us. Uh, and I found it actually so fascinating because the, with some of the questions I also wanted to to involve uh, colleagues from the audience uh, who also are experts and then we could actually make a very good panel. Uh, and I think that the, the, the biggest results for me from, from this discussion is that uh, we sketched several uh, several directions in which the future research can be going. And I think that's, uh, that this is exactly when we see that a meeting was super productive. Uh, so thank you once more and, and hopefully see you soon in person. <laughs>